I now have uh, uh, the honor to uh, introduce Professor David Wengro, who's going to give the uh, second lecture uh, this evening. Um, David is an extraordinary distinguished uh, archeologist and historian whose work ranges, as I understand it, across continents, um, focusing on some fundamental questions, particularly regarding city formation and the development of civic space and civility, which seem to challenge some of the dominant theories of early governance and state formation. And so for myself, it excites me as a student of politics um, and uh, a student of the spaces of the political, but also as a non-archeologist, I think it's probably time for me to pipe down and to hand over to David. So David, thank you very much. Better check that I'm audible, all right? No, not audible. What do we do? All right. That's my last slide. I'll just mention that in passing um, <laughs> before I begin the lecture backwards. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you, Carol. I hadn't actually realized, John, that, that you're stepping down, which um, really makes it a, a true honor to be here this evening. Um, and, and thank you for inviting me. It's really nice that you're mentioning undergraduate teaching to see some undergraduates uh, from our BA in archaeology and anthropology at UCL here tonight, alongside some people, Robin, who taught me when I was doing what they're doing <laughs> quite a long time ago. It's a bit disorienting. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the history of democracy, which I think is usually told in a way that reminds us that it's a very rare uh, thing, something hard to achieve. We don't generally talk about the history of democracy as a, a history of habit, people collectively governing their own affairs. We don't usually talk about it as a, a history of sensibility, uh, the feeling that everyone should have an equal say in decisions that affect them. Instead, it's often told as the history of a word, democracy, demokratia rooted in a particular cultural genealogy. Democracy's greatest exponents and sometimes its most bitter detractors have seen it as a unique product of the West, a conceptual breakthrough first achieved in the ancient Mediterranean by the same people who invented Western science, Western philosophy, a social invention which then hovered around Europe as a largely unrealized potential for something like 2000 years until it was revived by a similar cohort of geniuses in the Northwestern part of that continent. As my late co-author David Greber enjoyed pointing out, this story is so full of conceptual holes, so obviously incoherent that it takes enormous will to hold it together. The West, for example, has to be defined in half a dozen contradictory ways. Sometimes it's an intellectual tradition. Sometimes it's a geographical entity, sometimes even a cluster of psychological attributes. But of course, if we applied any of these usages consistently, the whole narrative would quickly fall apart. If, for example, the West is a tradition of people reading each other's writings, what does one make of the fact that until the 18th century, almost every author in that tradition who was preserved was explicitly anti-democratic? And if the essence of modern democracy is voting in competitive elections, what should we make of the fact that ancient Greeks considered elections an aristocratic mode of political appointment, but art with the values of democracy? It all smacks of special pleading, but pleading for what? I suggest there are two subtle messages being conveyed by those who still tell this story. One is that the history of democracy is ours now, in exactly the same sense as the Parthenon marbles. The other, as I mentioned, is that democracy is highly unusual in world history. Confronted with evidence of participatory decision-making in 
Central Africa, Oceania, Asia, or the indigenous Americas, historians and social scientists have frequently reacted by emphasizing that whatever was going on, there's some technical reason why it can't quite be considered democracy. But what would happen if we applied the same stringencies to fifth century Athens, a militaristic society, a slaveholding society founded on the systematic repression of women? What I'd initially hoped to do in this lecture is contribute to a growing discussion about how world history might look if we stopped doing that, if we stop employing double standards. And to illustrate the point, I was gonna take examples from outside the Western canon, mainly from ancient Mesopotamia uh, and Mesoamerica. But then I discovered something. Uh, I see you had trouble with this, but I'm going to try. Yes. This is what I found. Um, it's a book, uh, which which seems to have basically done exactly that, um, or at least a part of it. In in which case, I'm obviously happy for the intellectual company, but slightly disappointed that part of my topic today has already been covered. But then I read it uh, and, and felt that there were actually some questions uh, remaining. The book is The Decline and Rise of Democracy, A Global History from Antiquity to Today by David Stasevich. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly because I think he's watching remotely from New York where he is Dean of Social Sciences and a professor of politics. Apologies if I'm not getting it right. Um, in it, he provides, <laughs> oh, I knew this would happen. What, what does that mean? <laughs> correct A. Should I correct the A or? <laughs> Stop. Thank you, David. I think <laughs> it would be better for all of us if you go away now. <laughs> okay. Oh dear. Um, this isn't fair, but all right. <laughs> yes, it's just pantomime. Um, in it, he provides examples for what he calls early democracy from examples from ancient Mesopotamia, pre-conquest Mesoamerica, Buddhist India, the indigenous nations of the American Great Lakes and pre-colonial Central Africa. For a small number of historians, I've got an echo now, for a small number of historians who've trodden this path before, it's a familiar roster and all of these have been the cause of some debate. Is there any way to stop that echoing? Maybe not, oh, the, no. What I think distinguishes this book um, from some of those is the clear distinction that the author draws between what he calls early and modern forms of democracy, building on earlier work by John Donne, and also the explanation he gives as to why the early form was quite ubiquitous in world history, while the latter, he contends, was indeed a specific innovation of the West. I'm going to try to summarize David's uh, arguments briefly, I hope accurately. Um, and then in the main part of my talk, I want to explore a few of the examples he offers in a bit more detail and a bit more archeological detail too. Let me start with uh, his definition of modern democracy. In a modern democracy such as ours, he says, suffrage is ideally universal, but for most people, participation in the political process tends to be sporadic. Usually it takes the form of voting for political representatives in competitive elections, while for the rest of the time, most of us become virtually spectators in the political process and the business of government. By contrast, in what Stasevich calls early democracy, political enfranchisement is much more limited, for example, to adult men or to landowners. But for those entitled to take part, participation is quite routine and direct. 
So for him, this is a defining element of early democracy, as is the requirement for leaders to seek consent for their decisions from a council or an assembly that meets regularly and is relatively independent in its judgments. The formulation lends itself very well, I think, to comparative study. But Stasevich goes a, a bit further. He ventures a series of explanations, or, or perhaps better, given conditions, under which democratic governance of the early, more participatory kind is likely to thrive. I'm going to very quickly summarize those two, because that's really what I'm going to focus on in my own discussion. Early democracy, Stasevich argues, was a practical concession from the governors to the governed in lieu of sovereignty or a developed bureaucracy. It flourished, he suggests, where populations were small scale and central government was weak, so that rulers had few other means of accessing or directing the activities of their subjects, including the payment of taxes. According to Stasevich, history shows this to be true. Consultive, consensual government, he contends, developed in the gaps left by the collapse of strong states or occasionally in situations where those have never existed. In all cases, he suggests, participatory democracy was feasible only where populations were small enough to overcome the friction of distance required for assemblies and councils. I think these arguments bear close inspection because they have implications that go beyond our understanding of democracy's deep past to a consideration of its future. And I'll consider that by way of conclusion. What I want to do now is raise some historical and a few archeological questions about the proposed conditions under which participatory democracy thrives and declines. I'll start with a very brief discussion of points made by Stasevich in relation to ancient Greece, and then move on to consider examples drawn from ancient Mesopotamia and Mesoamerica. It's worth pointing out that in each case, the nature of the source materials for reconstructing political systems is very different. It makes control comparison difficult, but there are precedents, notably in the work of the famous Chicago anthropologist and archeologist, Robert McCormick Adams. So I'm gonna try in a very tiny way to follow in his footsteps. With regard to, um, it does play up, doesn't it? I'm just trying to go forwards. There we are. Oh, that looks about right. Um, with regard to the conditions that gave rise to democracy in ancient Greece, Stasevich himself notes that this whole issue of scale is not completely settled. The ancient Greek polis, as Moens Hansen puts it, was typically a lilliput, and that goes for the size of the territory and the size of the population, which usually reached no more than a few thousand inhabitants. So far, so good. However, classical Athens was exception. Seven or several orders of magnitude larger than most other Greek polis, occupying the entire Attic Peninsula, a territory of two and a half thousand square kilometers, with a population of at least 200,000 in the fourth century BC, of whom at least 30,000 were adult male full citizens. And in the preceding age of the Peloponnesian War, that number may have been twice as large. How about the preconditions for the emergence of Athenian democracy? Here, Stasevich places some importance on the earlier breakdown of what he calls a centralized and autocratic political order on the Greek mainland, whereby, and I quote, kings in large palaces had ruled states through bureaucracies together with a military elite. He's referring to the collapse of the Bronze Age palaces around 1200 BC, several centuries before the rise of the polis. But this characterization of Mycenaean polities as strong states sits, I think, a bit uneasily with current reconstructions based on archaeological survey and the analysis of Linear B texts. Population estimates for the Bronze Age palatial centers on the Greek mainland range from 5,000, in the case of Mycenae, the largest, 
down to just 500 or so inhabitants for the smallest, while the palace's ability to exert control over their hinterlands seems to have been limited to the periodic extraction of specific goods. A Mycenaean Wanax or overlord may have exercised little true sovereignty beyond his citadel, making do with seasonal tax raids on a surrounding populace whose lives otherwise went on beyond the scope of royal control or surveillance. Like the issue of scale, the argument that Athenian democracy arose from the ruins of strong autocratic states seems less than clear cut. Oh, and that was in fact, there he goes, Robert McCormick Adams and the book that I referred to comparing early urban development uh, in Mesopotamia and Mesoamerica. And it's to Mesopotamia now that I want to turn. And I'm going to depart here from Stasevich's account, which is uh, limited to the Bronze Age kingdom of Mari, Tel Hariri, uh, on the Syrian Euphrates, and specifically work done by the Assyriologist, uh, also I think at NYU, uh, Daniel Fleming, uh, on the cuneiform archives recovered from the royal palace of the Zimri Lin at Mari. Uh, he was its last ruler before it was captured and destroyed by Hammurabi of Babylon in 1761. For Stasevich, ancient Mari exemplifies what he calls the Swiss pattern, where democracy emerges in out of the way places. In this case, an ecologically marginal stretch of the middle Euphrates Valley with low rainfall and poor soils, far from the more densely populated floodplains of Southern Mesopotamia. But as Assyriologists like Fleming and Baryamovich have pointed out, the coexistence of monarchic rule with town councils, and with assemblies, is in no way confined to Mari or its environs. The idea that um, ancient Mesopotamia, must be a loose, loose connection. The idea that ancient Mesopotamia possessed a primitive democracy was first advanced in the 1940s by Thorkild Jakobsen. Others have since considered evidence that extends his idea. District councils and assemblies of elders were not just a feature of the very earliest cities in this region, as Jakobsen thought. There is evidence for them in all later periods of Mesopotamian history too, down to the time of the Assyrian, Babylonian, and Persian empires. Popular councils and citizen assemblies, Sumerian Ukin, Akkadian Puchrum, were stable features of government, not just in Mesopotamian cities, but also in their colonial offshoots, uh, like the old Assyrian Karam of Karnesh in Anatolia, and also in the urban societies of the Hittites, the Phoenicians, Philistines, the Israelites. In fact, as Baryamovich points out, it's almost impossible to find a city anywhere in the ancient Near East that didn't have some equivalent to a popular assembly, or often several assemblies, sometimes divided up to represent the young uh, and the old of the city. So in terms of collective governance, Mari was not particularly unusual, really just the tip of a much larger iceberg. And urban life, Oh no. Urban life in Mesopotamia actually extends back well into the fourth millennium BC. That's long before the rise of the kingdom of Mari. In fact, it's almost a thousand years before the earliest evidence of writing or monarchy. The nature of urban government in this long pre-monarchic, pre-dynastic period is a point of controversy. And the controversy focuses on this site, the ancient city of Uruk, modern Warka in southern Iraq. And it was actually the later mythology of this site that inspired Jakobsen's original search for what he called primitive democracy. At about 3,300 BC, Uruk was a city of about 200 hectares, dwarfing her neighbors on the southern Mesopotamian floodplain. 
Estimates of its population range very widely between about 20,000 and 50,000 inhabitants. And we actually know very little about the residential quarters. I see it's moved on. We do know that by the late fourth millennium BC, Uruk had an acropolis, much of which was taken up by the raised public district called Eana, House of Heaven, dedicated to the goddess Inanna. On its summit stood nine monumental buildings, and there was also this great court comprising an enormous sunken plaza, about 165 feet across, completely surrounded by two tiers of benches equipped with water channels to feed trees, offering much needed shade for open air gatherings. And these wonderful reconstructions from the recent book, Uruk, First City of the World. Just to put all this in some kind of spatial perspective, the Athenian Agora in the time of Pericles was also full of public temples, but the actual democratic assemblies took place in an open space called the Pnyx, a low hill equipped with seating for the council of 500 citizens appointed by sortition to election uh, to run the everyday affairs of the city. Everyone else was expected to stand. Meetings at the Pnyx could involve anywhere between 6,000 and 12,000 people, perhaps 20% or so of the city's total population. The Great Court at Uruk is considerably larger, and while we have only a vague idea, as I said, what the total population of Uruk was in, say, 3,500 BC, it's hard to imagine it was anything close to 5th century Athens, which might suggest a wider range of participation. But of course, in the absence of detailed written sources, all of this is quite speculative, which is why it's important to consider a third uh, and final example of what Stasevich calls early democracy, which again, I suggest, seems to stretch a bit the conditions that he sets for its very existence. This concerns, let's see, Yes, this concerns an indigenous city-state by the name of Tlaxcala, adjacent to what's now the Mexican state of Puebla. Tlaxcala, as we'll see, played a pivotal role in the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire or Triple Alliance. In his five letters of relation published between 1519 and 1526, Hernán Cortés recounts his entry into the mountain ringed valley of Puebla on the southern tip of the Mexican Altiplano. The valley at that time sheltered numerous cities, and it was in Tlaxcala that Cortés found local allies who fought alongside him, going on to lay waste to the Aztec capital at Tenochtitlan in the neighboring Valley of Mexico. Cortes estimated the population of Tlaxcala, including its rural dependencies, at 150,000 people. This is actually a figure that's roughly in line with modern archeological estimates. And it's broadly comparable in scale to fifth century Athens. There is a market in this city, he reported back to Charles V, in which more than 30,000 people are occupied in buying and selling. And the province contains, he said, many widespreading fertile valleys, all tilled and sown, no part of it being left wild. And it measures some 90 leagues in circumference. So this is not a marginal environment. He also observed, quote, that the order of government among the people resembles very much the republics of Venice, Genoa, and Pisa, for there is no supreme overlord. Tlaxcalan cannot be characterized as a small scale polity, not by Mesoamerican or other standards. As Stasevich himself notes, there was a bureaucracy with each council member taking responsibility for an administrative district. Nor can we reasonably argue that Tlaxcalan was in any sense a weak state. I mean, after all, they held off the Aztec empire uh, for quite a long time in the so-called flowery wars. And it was in fact their logistical capacity to furnish Cortes with many thousands of warriors that made possible his successful assault on the Aztec capital. Actually, he himself remarked after he'd been given a tour of the city and his words were, this place is larger than Granada and a lot stronger. Yeah. <laughs> 
We also have a remarkable source which records debates that took place in the Council of Tlaxcala at the time of the Spanish conquest, the unfinished chronicle by Francisco Cervantes de Salazar, who was one of the first rectors of the University of Mexico. He composed it between 1558 and 1563, relying on oral accounts of the children and grandchildren of those who were there at the time, including some direct descendants. In it, we get accounts of speeches and diplomatic gifts going back and forth between Spanish representatives and their Tlaxcalteca counterparts, whose oratory in council they found admirable. Those who spoke for Tlaxcala included elder statesmen, like Xicotencat, the elder, father to the military general, also called Xicotencat, who is still lionized in the state of Tlaxcala to this day but also indigenous masters of commerce, religious experts, and the legal authorities of their day. What the author describes in these passages, passages is clearly not the workings of a royal court, but a mature urban parliament that sought consensus for its decisions through reasoned argument and lengthy deliberations. Key segments of the text come in his book three, when Cortes is still encamped outside the city. A lord named Mashishkatsin gets the ball rolling with an eloquent appeal for Tlaxcaltecas to follow what is ordained by the gods and the ancestors and ally themselves with the Spaniards to rise up against their Aztec oppressors. His reasoning is widely accepted until Xicotencat the Elder, who's over a hundred years old and blind at this time, um, intervenes. Nothing, he reminds the council, is harder to resist than an enemy within. Why, asked Shikotenkat, and I change to his words now, why do we deem these invaders gods who seem more like ravenous monsters thrown up by the intemperate sea to blight us, gorging themselves on gold, silver, stones, and pearls, sleeping in their own clothes, and generally acting in a manner of those who would one day make cruel masters, there are barely enough chickens, rabbits, or cornfields in the whole land to feed their bottomless appetites or those of their ravenous deer. He meant the, the horses. Um, why should we who live without servitude and never acknowledge the king spill our blood only to make ourselves into slaves? And of course he was basically right because after the wars were over, it didn't take long for the Spanish government to rescind most of their privileges and turn uh, Tlaxcala into just another tributary city-state. Accounts like this haven't fared very well in the hands of modern historians. Some dismiss them as the author's fantasy projection of some scene from a Roman Senate. But this in itself requires an extraordinary stretch of the imagination because the Council of Tlaxcala continued to sit well into the colonial period. Its proceedings and the facility of its politicians in reasoned debate are recorded in the 16th and 17th century Tlaxcalan Actas. A stronger case can be made that the deliberations recorded in Spanish sources are exactly what they seem to be, a glimpse into the mechanics of collective urban government. If in some ways they resemble debates in Thucydides or Xenophon, this is surely because there are just so many ways to have a debate. Another source provides confirmation. In 1541, Friar Toribio de Benavente, called Motolinia, the afflicted one, by the locals, completed an account of Tlaxcala's constitution, which explains some of its underlying ideology. The city, he wrote, was indeed a republic, governed by a council of elected officials answerable to a common citizenry. How many sat on the high council of Tlaxcala is not clear. Some sources indicate 50, some up to as many as 200. Nor does Mottolini explain how exactly they were selected. But on the topic of modes of political training, his account comes alive. Far from being expected to demonstrate personal charisma, those who wanted to play a role on the Council of Tlaxcala did it in a spirit of self-deprecation. They were required to subordinate themselves to the people of the city. And to make sure this wasn't just pretense, each one of them was subject to trials. It started out with a mandatory exposure to public abuse. Like standing in front of the 
chat screen. Um, and then with one's ego in tatters, presumably, a long period of seclusion where the incumbent politician suffered ordeals of fasting, sleeping, sleep deprivation, whipping, bloodletting, and a strict regime of moral instruction. Clearly taking up office in this indigenous democracy required personality traits a bit different from those we take for granted in British modern politics. There is a final line of evidence concerning the political organization of Tlaxcala, and it comes from archaeology. Extensive field survey of levels of the city dating between the 13th and the 15th centuries, and I'm very grateful to David Carballo and his colleagues in Mexico for these images. Uh, they show that Tlaxcala was a densely populated settlement of about 300 hectares with a population of between 22 and perhaps 50,000 people. It's actually quite similar in scale and in the vagueness of our population estimates to ancient Uruk in the fourth millennium BC. Long before any European set foot there, the city was already organized on an entirely different basis to Tenochtitlan and most other Mesoamerican city-states of what archaeologists call the late post-classic period. It's no sign of a palace, no central temple, no pyramids, and no major ball court. This is important because the ball courts are a very important uh, place for royal ritual in other cities. Instead, archaeological survey gives us a cityscape given over almost entirely to the well-appointed uh, residences of its citizens forming some 20 neighborhoods. The biggest municipal assemblies took place in a civic complex called Tizatlan, the blue bit on the right there. This was located on a hill about a kilometer outside the city with spaces for public gatherings entered via broad gateways, ending, uh, sorry, extending over an area of about 15,000 square meters. That's about five times larger than the Athenian Nix. It's time to draw together some conclusions. Historians and archaeologists must surely welcome efforts to introduce deep historical perspectives into modern political theory. Stasevich's work, like that of Dunn before, is exemplary, and my qualifications are really just intended as dialogue, not, to, not as criticism. When he concludes his own book, Stasevich asks about the prospects for modern democracy in light of history. Is a broad but thin democracy the best we can hope for, or even something we should be thankful for, given the alternatives? Stasevich does consider the case for a return to early democracy in its more participatory forms, and he notes experiments on these lines, which take inspiration from the city republics of medieval Italy or early American colonies like those of Connecticut and Rhode Island. They include the establishment of people's assemblies that exclude elite members of society, appointment procedures that combine lottery with election, political trials conducted by citizens, and recalling elected officials to the list. But he doubts whether such experiments could work on a modern demographic scale, even in an age of digital communication and the transcendence of distance, which this allows. He may be right from a distance, but what I've tried to show in my lecture is that these doubts can't really be firmly anchored in the evidence of the past, which provides an increasingly rich source of information to show that throughout history, popular self-government has not typically been confined to small-scale units or marginal settings, but just as often can be found close to the demographic centers of human activity. Where does this leave us? Or at least those of us who like democracy. It leaves us with one major obstacle, the extension of state power by executive order, overriding judicial and legislative checks and the reduction of demographic procedures to what Stasevich calls charismatic extremism. Surely he's right to ask, not just whether democracy will survive, but whether it will survive in a form that merits its name. Will we look 
for inspiration to the assemblies of Athens, Uruk, or Tlaxcala, or to the aristocratic contests of heroic ages with their endless agons, races, duels, games, gifts, and sacrifices. My aim today has been to argue that, at least from the perspective of world history, we may in fact have more of a choice than we tend to think. I'll finish there. Thank you. David, thank you very much indeed for a wonderful and uh, powerful tour de force and tour d'horizon, as it were, of various civilizations at various times, but also, more importantly, giving us an idea about how we think the very term that we put value in, democracy, we've used it and abused it and misused it over time. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that came out from what you were saying, uh, which I found so interesting, was that the act of citizenship is not confined to one place or one time or one period of history, and nor does it necessarily result in what we would think of as fully fledged democracy, mm -hmm. whatever that is. So I think that focus on citizenship and therefore the, the polis and the city, whatever uh, culture it's in, I think is a key part of that. And with it, of course, goes the checks and balances that you were talking about. So I think um, in some parts of the world, uh, the assemblies had to take part, this is in, in uh, the Sahel in West Africa, mm. uh, they had to take place under structures that prevented you from standing up. Mm. So you had to engage with your fellow citizens mm -hmm. in a way that denied you mm -hmm. the bombast, the ability to stand at a podium mm -hmm. and hold mm -hmm. forth. So I better stop there. But thank <laughs> you very much indeed for a, a wonderful talk uh, this evening, very thought provoking. Um, just to say that uh, there won't be questions and answer from the podium, but there is refreshment thanks to the uh, British School in Athens, at Athens uh, outside, and there'll be a chance to put questions to the speakers as well. So please uh, join me in another round of applause for both speakers, both for John and for David. Thank you.